Okay, so today I'm talking about The Selfish Gene by Richard Dawkins. This guy, I mean, this came out, what, 1976 or something? This book's been around for a while. I mean, I, I went out and got this book, and it's the, it's the 40th anniversary edition. This is huge. Uh, it's a huge book, groundbreaking, and when he wrote it, uh, he goes to a lot of detail to really explain, <laughs> I mean, 500 pages. Uh, he goes to a lot of trouble to explain genes at their basic, right? In the most basic form, how they develop into these molecules, how the molecules become complex organisms, how complex organisms develop uh, chemical, uh, chemical reactions to sunlight that creates energy that animals then exploit to, to then... Um, all of these different evolutionary trends he goes through and really explains how it all came to be, how it all works, and it's all from a biological standpoint. <sighs> the purpose of his book is to really look at selfishness and altruism, which is the opposite of, of selfishness, and consider whether or not morality is evolutionary, if, it's, if morality is biological. And it's not. <laughs> uh, you know, the whole question of whether or not selfishness is nature or nurture, he says that's not even the point. Because from his perspective, from a biological perspective, a gene is a capsuled set of blueprints, instructions, whose sole purpose is to survive in order to replicate. That's it. And when you consider a single-celled single organism, and its whole reason for being is to replicate and survive, right? The idea that a molecule of all of these different genes would then become its own machine for survival, when you scale that out to a, a, a creature, an animal, a human, right? We are the most complex of these little genes that honestly they genes are not moral they they don't have a conscious conscience and so the consciousness is an effect of this biological evolution and it's a really interesting take because by chapter 10 he starts to introduce things like reciprocal altruism but it's all based on this biological perspective which is really cool. And only with that foundation of, of a biological perspective of what a gene is can you really dig in and understand the connection he makes between human genes and genetic transmission of traits and, and attributes um, and relate that to cultural transmission of traits and attributes. Uh, language. Language develops so much faster than like fish learning how to walk. <laughs> you know, that took how many generations, how many millennia did it take for, for that evolution to occur? You know, just as a, as a um, novel example. But he really looks at the idea that that soup of evolution millions of years ago, uh, where little molecules their sole purpose for being was to defend themselves from other molecules, take advantage of other molecules in order to survive and to replicate, that now what these, these cultural transmission of, not genes, cultural transmission of what he calls memes, yeah, he uses the word meme. It's really funny. It took me a few minutes to kind of get over that um, connection to today's internet memes. <laughs> but it's, it is essentially the same thing, communicating ideas that then... Um, either survive or not, right? They require transmission in order for survival and replication. And then through that replication can evolution occur and take ideas and develop them further. But he makes the point to say that in the last several, you know, okay, tens of thousands of years, language has allowed for a new soup of survival. The survival of ideas, of thoughts, and concepts. And so this is... Um, you know, like, like faith is a meme and, and patriotism and politics and, and uh, you know, all of these things he really digs in because selfish genes, right? Any gene responsible for a particular 
uh, attribute um, is not going to be itself selfish because selfish and and selfishness and altruism are perceived are perceptions of other people's biological desire to survive and replicate so it's it's a really interesting take and you know he even says selfish genes you know genes have no foresight genes are not conscious uh, beings out to hurt and hurt anybody in fact he says animals in the animal kingdom the 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 wild kingdom actually has rules so that animals don't just go around killing everybody because they think they're the ones who should survive no they don't have that ego they actually animals in the wild kingdom respond to ecological unspoken truths that other creatures need to survive they only need what they need and it's a really interesting balance he he you know he mentions how animals rarely die of old age they always die of some other cause because it's all a give and a take and so it's it's a really interesting idea he actually goes to a lot of trouble in chapter 12 to explain <laughs> the prisoner's dilemma and it's it's if no other reason to buy this and read this book is to get his take on this this wonderful wonderful idea the prisoner's dilemma which is a non-zero sum game right where two people have to decide on their own separate from each other don't tell each other what they're going to do and uh, and somebody gives them this this dilemma this uh, ultimatum where depending on what they pick one person can benefit more than if they collaborate but that it has a cooperative option that benefits everybody even though the selfish aspect of it allows for one person to gain more um, so it's an interesting game and he goes he has a whole it's one of the longest chapters in the book the selfish gene um, has so many great stories so much great research so many great revelations uh, I highly recommend reading this book even if it takes you you know weeks go through it really take your time look up words you don't know um, excellent excellent book okay and you know what just because as I was going through this again for this review I uh, I actually pulled out this book because so much about what he talks about uh, with selfishness and altruism really gets at uh, cognitive behavioral therapy choice theory uh, uh, there's a lot of psychology that he eventually gets into with, with cultural transmission of, of memes and language and things and I wanted to really touch on just a few things in this awesome book by William Glasser, right? And this, uh, this book is it, it's pretty groundbreaking. It also came from the 70s. And just in chapter one, a couple of things. Like, he says, stimuli does not exist, okay? When you communicate with someone else, it's not the information that they are sending to you that exists. <laughs> it is... When stimuli comes at you, when somebody communicates toward you, <laughs> it is only how that information is interpreted that it exists in any sort of form. So he has three particular beliefs with, um, with this whole idea of what he calls external control uh, psychology. Three beliefs about control. Because when you're talking about choice theory, control is everything, right? You either have a first belief where uh, I respond to a single uh, external signal, right? Uh, I open the door when the doorbell rings. Uh, I stop at a red light, those types of things. That's the sense of control, okay? Second belief. I can make other people do what I want them to do, even if they don't want to do it, and other people can control how I act, think, and feel, right? That's the second belief. And the third belief is that it is right, and even my moral obligation, to ridicule, threaten, or punish those who don't do what I tell them to do, or even reward them if it will get them to do what I want. Now, this book's been around for 50 years, and any educator that hears those statements might kind of wriggle a little bit like yeah sometimes you got to do that <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
And what he, he what this guy eventually gets to, you know, he talks about you know beliefs or how they're genetically programmed to satisfy his four psychological needs. You know, he gets into a lot of deep stuff with this stuff. But essentially, external control is a two-way street. You can try and control someone, but unless they're willing to accept and interpret your attempts to control as things that, honestly, are of value to them, either personally, interpersonally, or otherwise, you know, it's, it's not going to work. And he goes in towards the end of the book here, where our attempts to control, uh, especially in regards to parents and children, or students and, and teachers, our attempts to control destroys the only control we have, our relationships. And, and it's really a good, uh, it's a good statement. I mean, he gives a story about bedtime uh, with a four-year-old using choice theory. And that is a delicate process. He is very, very understanding of that. But that you have to start that process in order to develop that understanding of choice and understanding and and as the child grows up, as their brain starts to formulate and start to consider ideas and cause and effect of things and their own uh, actions and their impact on other people, you got to start them that early. Otherwise, they're going to get into middle school and bedtime is going to be atrocious. <laughs> um, he goes into schooling where uh, forcing people to learn has never been successful, uh, yet we continue to do it because we think it's right. That's belief number two and three. Um, you know, the whole idea that education is not acquiring knowledge, this is him saying this. It is best defined as using knowledge. That's education. The dictionary defines knowledge as the fact or awareness of knowing something. I recognize that you have to know something to use it, but except in some television quiz shows or party games, there's little value in merely knowing something. The value is in using what you have learned, and this is where schools fail to focus. And I made a big note to mention that because for me as someone really into self-directed learning as a philosophy the best teachers require students to think not just to know and that gets us back into the whole idea of motivation I mean the problem with allowing children to start to explore their own inter interpretation of what they want to learn and how they want to learn it really is hard to watch them choose things that we don't want them to choose so there we get back into that control aspect and it's not an easy quick answer it really is going to be very personalized it's going to be very individualized for every person and you know he even says there's there's times when having somebody prof come in professionally and, and help psychologically to help balance that out could help keep uh children and students and adults from developing some really terrible interpretations of their worldview, you know? Um, he goes into coaching and discipline where co coercive programs work with students who have teachers or schoolwork in, in, in their quality world. And he goes into a lot of depth about what a quality world is. It's the people that connect with him. It's the people within his, his or her immediate world that know him, that communicate with him on a daily or weekly basis. Um, but the students that have those people, that have that schoolwork in that quality world of theirs, them, those students, those children, they're not the ones who need the coercive programs. And so for so many students that have that, that two-parent household and, and the, the, you know, all of the safety and, and needs met all of their steam needs their belonging they're working on self-actualization by the time they get to upper elementary school you know all of these kids they don't need that coercive traditional structure um they have already developed their own intrinsic value and so i think that's that's a great point for developing self-directed learning um, in schools especially those that have the resources and have the environment to support it and for schools that may be struggling with safety and resources and, and environment um, not only working on the larger societal developments and needs but uh, making sure that you don't rely on those external control factors as a means for solving the problems 
but as a means for getting the attention to shift out of those habits and mindsets, you know? Uh, Choice Theory by William Glasser, another great, great book. Highly recommend reading it just for yourself, your students, for, for anybody. Check it out.